that is even more important. So tie the new dirty. And then we have the married couples Christmas party. So it's going to be Saturday, September 2nd, from 6 to 9 p.m. Dece December 2nd, not September. Sorry, I won't be here. And it's going to be at the Peters residence in Burlingame. And this is for engaged and married couples. An annual married couples Christmas party. A child care will be provided for a small free fee for a 1 to 11 year old. 11 year olds. If you have any questions, please see Jasmine after church so you guys can sign up for this and so she knows how many people are coming. And uh, all are welcome. Right? It's very important to um, spend time with the body together, not just here at church on a Sunday, but through the week. Right? Christ has brought us together to be the body of Christ. We're supposed to lift each other up, and this is just a good time to get to know your brethren and your sisters in Christ. And the last thing is the, the Christmas um, services. So we're going to have two services on the 24th, one at 10 a.m. It's going to be a regular service uh, where the children's ministry will be uh, open, and then there's one at 4 p.m. that's probably going to be about a, an hour-long service where... Uh, Children are going to come into the sanctuary, so this is for your families. So just plan on that. And then if you guys would like to bring your families and friends, like uh, this is a perfect opportunity to share the love of Christ. And uh, why we celebrate Christmas. Um, I was just sharing this weekend that Christmas should be every day of our life. That every day we celebrate the birth of Christ and, and what he has done for us. So, um, so we just bow our heads and we'll pray for today's service. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, Lord, to just thank you for uh, giving us another opportunity to serve you, Lord. Just giving us a place to, to come together, to worship you, Lord, to, to pour our hearts out before you, Lord. To thank you for everything that you've done, Lord, to all the spiritual blessings, Lord, and, and, and just giving yourself up for us, Lord, so we can have eternal life with you. So I pray, Lord, that your spirit moves forward, Lord. I pray that you would anoint Pastor Jason's lips, Lord, and that your words would come out of his mouth, Lord. And I pray that he who has an ear would hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, Lord. And that we'd be attentive to your word and what you want to do in each one of our lives. So I pray this all in Jesus' most wide name, we're praying. Amen. Amen. All right. Can we all stand together as we worship that?
Father, we give you praise and give you thanks this morning, Lord. We just turn our hearts to you, God, and remember all the good things you've done for us, Lord.
extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you.
saints bless you, Lord, this morning. We bless you. May you sit upon the throne of our praises, Lord, this morning. You're high and lifted up, O oh Lord. Thank you, God, that we get to know you, that we get to worship you, that we get to be with you for eternity, Lord. We know that where you are, there's light and life. There's no sin, no more tears, God. There's joy and peace everlasting. Thank you so much, Lord. Continue to worship you this morning, God, as we go into your word. Lord, Holy Spirit, speak to us um, through your word and through, um, through Pastor Jason, God. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Yeah, go ahead and greet your neighbor. Morning, uh, welcome to Calvary San Mateo. How about that worship, huh? Come on. It's beautiful to worship together with the saints. Uh, it's great worshiping by yourself, that's awesome. Uh, I love worshiping together with other brothers and sisters. It's just, uh, it's, it's special. It's a special thing we get to do. We get to sing unto the Lord. Um, I don't know how many of you sing as a routine thing. <laughs> but we get to sing as unto the Lord. I know sometimes I shouldn't be singing, but I'll be singing. And uh, hopefully other voices that are better will just drown mine out. That's my goal. So uh, if you hear me, then you know, like, I better turn it up if I can sing. And I'm sure most of you can sing just fine. So good morning. Welcome uh, again to Calvary San Mateo. It's a rainy day out there. Uh, Tis the season for uh, the beard. Uh, so it's a couple days growth for me right here. And um, it's my superpower, so uh, it's, it's, it's what I do in the winter. But we're, uh, we're going to be in the book of John. we got uh, Granny Pat passing out Bibles if anyone needs a Bible. Uh, there's many apps that you can use as well, great Bible apps out there uh, that help you take notes and all kinds of different things, but uh, we want you to be aware of that. Uh, we also had Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving celebration here on Thanksgiving. How many had a good Thanksgiving? Good Thanksgiving? <laughs> So full, a little comatose, all that turkey. Any leftovers, leftover turkey sandwiches going on, right? I, um, I, we always have a, a bash here, we have for the last several years, and I make the mistake of like eating a tremendous amount of food, and an amount of food that a human being should not eat, around 2 p.m., and I eat so much food that I, I don't want to think about food again for a long time, and I always forget to take leftovers, and then about 7 or 8 o'clock rolls around on the same day, and, and I'm like, I'm hungry again. How is this possible? And I've taken no leftovers, and I have to scrounge around. But anyway, hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving. So we're in the book of John this morning, chapter 15. If you could open up there or scroll to that spot. We are in John 15. And I've been looking forward to getting to John 15 for a long time. John 15 is a very classic section of Scripture. It's a very... Uh, prominent section of Scripture. It's a very clear section of Scripture. It's a section of Scripture that you might find written on coffee mugs or on throw rugs or on, on posters in house walls. Uh, but these verses hopefully will be a blessing as we go through them. So if we could stand, if you're able, as we read John 15, verse 1 through 7 is where we're going to be at says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Father, we, we don't take your word lightly, Lord. We, we want to exalt your word this morning. God, we want to learn from your word. God, we want this to intersect our lives, God, and, and meet us where we are at, Lord. We want this to get into our life and our soul, God, that we would live this out, God, that we would be forever changed by the Word of God this morning. So we pray, God, that you would speak, Lord. I ask that you be glorified this morning in the, the, the proclamation of your Word, God, the, the teaching of your Word. And God, that uh, anything that you don't want said would not be said, Lord. And anything you do want said would be proclaimed. And so, God, we give you this time, our attention spans, and all these things. God, would you strengthen them? Would you uh, allow us, Lord, to worship you by hearing from your word? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You will could go ahead and have a seat. So we're in John 15. We've uh, been going at this for about 64 weeks now through the book of John. And we're in chapter 15. It gives you a little uh, taste of how, how fast we've been going. But even through these verses, uh, we're going through verses 1 through 7 this morning. And there is a lot to be said. Uh, the, the, the section kind of breaks nicely at 11, but that was just too much to go through. So we're in 1 through 7 in the context, of course, is the Last Supper. Jesus has been at the Last Supper with his 12 disciples. Judas left, so now there's 11 disciples that he's been with at the Last Supper, pouring into them, teaching them about the kingdom and and all that's going to come. And at the end of chapter 14, they rise and they go from that upper room that they were at. So now, in this section, they're walking, probably, uh, together, um, and Jesus gives this great story. Jesus uh, was a master storyteller. And stories have a way of sticking with us, especially if they're something that's familiar. And this culture was very familiar with, with vines and with growing things. And, and, and they were all, you know, had dirt under the fingernails, uh, probably more than we do, but uh, we can also relate as well because. Uh, we understand these things of, of growth and trees and, and vineyards. And so they were probably, they could have been walking by a vineyard. And I love how Jesus would do this, uh, walking with his disciples, pointing at anything and everything to, to show the truth of God. All truth is God's truth. And so he could pull uh, an analogy or a sermon out of anything. And this, of course, is a very prominent one. So they could have been passing by a vineyard and he, and he could have, looked at the, the vineyard and, and started into uh, this section right here. Or perhaps they were passing by the temple. And the temple in Jerusalem, the, the doors, the gates of the temple, what they would have is these golden emblem, these, these carved golden uh, vines on the temple gates. And so it, he was possibly referring to those vines on the gates. It was very prominent. Everyone would have known about this. It was like a landmark that you would see the temple, you would see the gates, and you would see these these vines on them. And so he goes into this analogy. And and the picture of a vineyard was a very familiar one to their ears. Uh, In the Old Testament, God's people are described as God's vineyard. Israel is described as the vineyard of God. It is it is what he has planted and cares for like the vine dresser as he is in this story. But, but Israel was often unfaithful and they forgot about the promises of God and they, they were fruitless in a lot of what they did. They didn't, their lives didn't bear much fruit. 
And so if you would, if, if this was a movie scene, you would see the vineyard or the gates or whatever he's speaking about, and it would bring their minds to Israel, to all the Old Testament, all that the prophets had spoken about and God's people, who they were to be. And then you would zoom in on Christ, who, who He is the picture of what He says here, the true vine, the true vine. So this vineyard you have, the whole point of the Old Testament, the whole point of God's people of Israel was through, that the Messiah would come from Israel. That the, the, the line of the Messiah would come and bless the whole world. So Jesus is pictured as the true vine here. And then you have the vine dresser who would be the father, who would be the one who cares for the vineyard and, 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 and tenderly shapes it. So it's very practical for them to understand this picture and how it works. And it is timeless for us. So verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And we've heard that phrase a few times, the I am. Jesus has said the I am. Now this is his seventh time saying I am. The I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. This is the last one. This is the seventh one. I am the true vine. The, the, the people of God were that vineyard, but it was all pointing to me. Everything points to Christ in the Bible. And He is the true vine. The one that was promised. And so, He is the true vine. And this, this story speaks of the connection that we are supposed to have with Christ. The connection that is made possible because of the Gospel, because of Christ, that we are supposed to have. That we are made to have. And essentially, that is what this is about is being connected with God. This morning, I titled the sermon, All These Connections. All These Connections. Actually, it took a while to come up with a, a, a title of, of this. There were so many things to just you know, go with. Uh, uh, abide in the vine, uh, you know, vine and branches, various things. But when I looked at these verses, it, it speaks about the connection that we are to have with God. And and we can all understand that, I think. We can understand connections. We live in a very connected world. You could say that this is the most connected human beings have ever been. This is the most uh, able that we have been to connect with people uh, near us or far from us that's ever been on the earth. This, this just this social media craze, this connection craze that we are living in, that we are more connected than ever, and we are also more distracted than ever. There is so much going on. There is so much to take up our thoughts and our time, and really going after it. Um, if you go on Facebook, it, it, they changed it recent. Well, not recently anymore, but when you watch a video on Facebook, you'll notice that right before that video starts to end, it, it starts scrolling to the next video, right? These these are methods that they've adopted from. Las Vegas casinos that would, that would grab your attention and hold it. How many of you try and go on a social media and you're like, I'm going to go on for one minute? <laughs> you know, and 30 minutes later, you're like, what? I just, I can't stop the scroll, you know? And, and these connections that we can make have possibly made us more distracted than ever. It's been said that, that social media connects us with those who are far from us, but separates us from those who are close to us. You know, who's been out to dinner and, and, and maybe it's been your family or, or seen people gathered together, everyone's on their phone and they're all sitting at the same booth, but they're all like really connecting with other people that aren't there and they're there, but they're missing that moment. So it's the enigma of this connection craze that we have. And social media and these currencies can be seen as currency in our day even. These companies are ginormous, right? We, we see that when, uh, when, when Facebook bought Instagram for a measly billion dollars now, you know, it seems because they would have been worth at least $30 billion on their own. But when they bought them for a billion dollars, Instagram was a, a, a 468-day-old company. You know, I remember reading a tweet that they, in 468 days, were worth more than the New York Times, who's been around for 100 like almost 100 years. You know, New York Times was only worth like $987 million, and here you have this 
young company that was worth a billion. And I work with a guy who actually came from, uh, came from Facebook and was a part of that, them buying Instagram. And he said, because, because uh, Zuckerberg saw that Instagram was able to uh, keep the attention of, of uh, the user uh, retention. People loved going on there and just looking at photos. And he saw that as a possible competitor, so he, he bought them. And uh, Twitter actually had uh, bought a service called Vine. I don't know if you ever, anyone ever Vined in here, but they had a thing called Vine, and they bought them. And, and it was, I remember when I first heard about it, and, and some friends that were into it, it was six-second video clips, right? I, I mean, are we ADD or what? <laughs> like six, that's all really people want to see, is give me six seconds of something, and, and we're good. You know, anything longer than that, I just, I don't got the time, or, or I can't stay uh, tuned to that. So six second video clips um, was Vine, uh, you know, to, to connect us. And, and so you have all these connections these days. And, and, and they, they almost make light of the whole, the whole importance of, of being connected. There's just so much going on. Twitter has uh, followers. You can follow people. And, and it kind of makes light of that because you're not really following. That's what it's called when you want to follow, but you may not check it for a while. There's a meme that has Jesus sitting at a bench with a, a, a teenager, and, and he's like, and, and he says, no, I'm, I'm talking about literally following me. You know, I'm not talking about Twitter. You know, like literally following me. And, and so it's made light. And, and, and LinkedIn, you could be connected with people that you might not even know. Maybe you're just trying to spy on them a little bit and uh, see who they are. Uh, you know, friends on Facebook, right? It's like, yeah, I have 5,000 friends. Uh, no, not really, you know? It's just impossible to have that much. So amidst all these connections, the most important connection that we must, uh, that is offered to us and that we must cultivate and, and, and make sure that we have is the connection to Christ. And that's my first point this morning, is that we would connect to Christ. That amidst all the other connections, the, the good ones, the very important ones, the, the real life connection with the 3D person, you know, and breathing person, those connections, social media, whatever, the most important connection is the vertical connection that we have with Christ, that is offered to us in this picture, that He is the true vine and we are the branches the this vertical connection that we have with God must be the most important when we prioritize the vertical connection with God all the other horizontal relationships and connections will fall into place we, we need to prioritize our focus on the Lord and this picture is an unmistakable one for us that we are connected like a branch to the vine, that Christ is the vine. All sustenance, all nutrients, all water rises through that vine, and we are simply a branch. And I love this picture for, that he's given because it's very easy to think of. I even thought about bringing a tree and a branch of people. I'm like, that's dumb, because we all know trees. Like, we, you know, it doesn't have to be done because it's just like, it's kind of cheesy. We, we know trees. There's, there's trees right outside. You know, uh, there's some fake trees right up there. You know, we understand this very clearly. And so I love that God has given us three, right now, 3.04 trillion reminders on the earth of how we're supposed to be connected to Him. Because uh, there's 3.04 trillion trees uh, on, on the earth. So when you look at a tree, when you look at a vine, that you would remember what he's talking about here. This is our relationship with the Lord, that we are connected to Christ. And that we are just a branch. We're just a branch. He's the vine, and we are a branch. And a branch is essentially really just a, a, a tube. It's just a pipe. It's just a conduit, right? A branch is nothing special, right? Right? But it's very, it's, it's very important. It's needed, right? Because a branch, a branch, what this picture shows is that Christ is the, the, the vine, the trunk, and a branch comes off of that. And, and what, what's at the end of a branch, typically? Leaves, right? Leaves or, or fruit. 
or something, it's producing something. There's some kind of output from the branch. So when we are connected to Christ as a branch, there should be fruit. There should be something flowing through us. We are simply a conduit for God's grace to the world. We must remain connected to Him as the vine, and we extend out like a branch does. It reaches out, right? Jesus just got done saying recently uh, that, that we will do greater things than Him, and we talked about that it's, it's greater in number. It's, it's, it's not greater in power in the things that He did, but it's just the greater in extent of what Christ did because we can simply branch out further. There's simply more of us. There's more time. You have thousands of years of church history. You have the, the impact of the gospel of billions of people that would serve God, that would reach out to a dying and broken world and be God's hands and feet is the point of it. So how do we connect? How do we connect? How do we, how do we know it? Well, we, we believe, right? That's the theme of this, this series that we're in. We believe. We have faith. We start there. We have faith in God. Right? As Hebrews 11 encourages us to, that, that, uh, that when we come to God, we must first believe that He exists and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We start there with the trust. And this relationship involves certain things. So you say, how do you connect with Christ? Well, how do you connect with anybody? How do you connect with anybody in your life? Well, you give them time, right? You, you, you give them time. If, if there's someone you care about, you're going to give them time. Every relationship takes time. And how much time do you give for this connection with Christ, for the, the relationship that you have with God? How much time do you invest into that relationship, right? Every good relationship takes time. There was a, a pastor that said one of the great uses of Facebook and Twitter in the last day is going to be to show that prayerlessness was not for lack of time, right? These things that can suck all of, a lot of our time and, and, and typically uh, you know, end up being somewhat meaningless will show that we actually had time. If we could have disciplined ourselves and put our time in the right spot. Jesus says here in this, these verses, in, in verse 3, He says, the word that I have spoken to you, you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. In verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So his words, he's spoken, right? That, that we, we hear from him. We listen via his word, via the Holy Spirit speaking to us. That we would hear from God, right? Any relationship, uh, we, we must let the other person speak. We must know who they are. We must know their heart, know what they're about. And then verse 7 also then says, if my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So there's a time to listen, and there's a time to speak. There's a time to ask. There's a time to pray, to seek the Lord, to, to share your petitions with Him, to, to, to speak, right? We, we've been given a good proportion of how that should be done, right? We have two ears and one mouth, and it's been said you should l therefore listen twice as much as you speak, you know, and, and, and same with the Lord, that we should listen, how, how much time are we giving to listening to the Lord? You know, not only time, but, but what, what are we doing with that time? Are we seeking Him? Are we hearing from the Lord? Are we then asking of the Lord? Laying our prayers at, at His feet. And verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words and you ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Is God answering your prayers? I mean, one of the most amazing privileges we have as Christians is to be able to pray. And one of the most amazing things that could ever happen is when we pray and God answers our prayers. I'm telling you, there's nothing better than that. When you pray and God answers your prayers, the, the king of the universe is answering your prayers, is interceding in your life, and you're, see, you're seeing it flesh out and come to fruition. I mean, is there anything that could ever rival that? That we have access to the throne of God. So don't just connect the once a week with God. We connect every day. We have the privilege to, to connect with the vine. We must connect with Him. We are a branch. We, our sustenance must come from Him. I read a poem that was interesting by Wilbur Reese. He said, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk 
or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love my neighbor or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want war- the warmth of the womb and not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. And I was struck by this because how we just want God to fit into our schedule. We just want enough of God that, that makes us comfortable and we want God to have a seat at the table, but we don't really want him to say anything unless he's spoken to. That this is the eternal ruler of the universe, that our connection must be sought after. It will, not, not a once a week, not a, not a light thing, that this is the most important connection that we could have, is the connection that we have with God. The connection. So he says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch, there's our role, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So there's two types of branches that he's dealing with here. He's, he's, he's dealing, the vine dresser is looking at branches. And he's looking for branches that are bearing fruit and those that aren't. And the, the purpose of the vine dresser, the father here, is, is to clear away the branches that bear no fruit so that the branches that do can bear more fruit. And the second point is that it cuts the clutter. It cuts the clutter, the vine dresser does. So you have branches that bear fruit and branches that are fruitless, the ones he takes away. And I was reading about trees this week, as you could imagine, and and branches and vines uh, in, in studying for this. And there are trees that will be an apple tree or will be a peach tree, and they bear no fruit. Or some branches on it bear no fruit. Or the whole tree maybe doesn't bear any fruit. And, and what do people do with that? If they wanted an apple tree, well, they're going to get rid of that tree, right? And they're going to get another tree that hopefully bears them fruit. And I was reading why this could take place in a tree, and it, and it said the number one reason that this takes place is called excessive tree vigor. Excessive tree vigor causes this to happen. And it, it means that, uh, it, it said, an over-vigorous tree expends all their energy in growing wood and not any energy on producing flower buds. And I thought that was interesting, that, that we could maybe glean from that a little further here as this analogy is made that this, this tree spends all of its energy making wood and just a ton of branches and none of its energy on producing fruit, right? And it, it brought a lot of things to mind as, as Christians. Our lives can be spent about doing so many things that aren't really kingdom focused, that aren't really about bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Like what in our life is, is bearing fruit? When you look at your life, where, where is the fruit? What fruit is God producing in your life? Because we're very busy. This is a very busy culture, right? We're, everyone's super busy. But what is it really producing that's eternal, that's going to last? Especially as Christians, we know it. We have the inside scoop here, right? This life is a vapor. We know that. And so we should be pouring and investing in that which is eternal and that which is going to bear fruit, the fruit of righteousness that, that is going to bear fruit to reaching the world with the gospel, to, to doing the good that God wants us to walk in, that he's prepared beforehand for us. So this was a warning to me as well that what am I spending my energy on? You know, so many spending their energies on just this life, on, on making it, on success, on on, on, on popularity, on, on whatever it is, on, on that nest egg, whatever they're going after, spending all that energy, what is it just going to fall to the ground in the end? And this, that we would not put all of our energy into what is temporary, but we would put our energy into bearing fruit. And so the fruit, so the branches that are, are fruitless are going to be cut off and removed and, and thrown away and burned, this says. Speaking of, of the, the judgment of God, that, that they're, they're removed. 
they're made to bear fruit. We are made to bear fruit. We are made to be connected to the vine and to bear fruit. That is the, the, the purpose for our existence, is to know God, is to enjoy God, is to be His people. And so the branches that bear fruit, notice the branches that bear fruit, He does something with as well, the vine dresser. And He prunes them. He prunes them. And, 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 and pruning involves a, a cutting, a cutting away. You know, that branch, it's bearing fruit, but there's a lot of twigs going on. And so he goes and he cuts away the, the, the clutter on the branch. A vine dresser, uh, a more technical term, could be a, a viticulturist, somebody who's, who's like a professional gardener, vine dresser, someone that takes care of these. And there's four operations to pruning that a vine dresser does to a, 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 a tree or a vine or a plant. And one is they remove uh, vigorous growing tips so that they wouldn't grow too rapidly. So when they, they look at a plant or a tree that's growing and they're caring for it, if there's some wild offshoots growing too rapidly, he's going to be like, all right, slow down. You know, so you're running around the pool a little too fast. Slow down. Let me trim those off. He will trim them so they don't go too fast. The second thing is he, he, he cuts the ends one or two feet back so they wouldn't be snapped by the wind. So as the whole thing starts to get too big for its own good, you know, too big for its britches, he wants to make sure that the, the branches don't get too big, that the wind blows it over. So he keeps it, keeps it trim. The third is a removal of some flower, fruit, or grape clusters so that those left could produce more and better quality fruit. So if it just starts getting all kinds of fruit everywhere, he's going to prune some of that back because he doesn't want it spread too thin. He wants the focus of the good branches to bear really good fruit. You know, I don't want a lot of like mediocre fruit. You know, he's like, I want to make sure what's being born here is the good fruit. And then the fourth thing he does is, uh, this says the removal of suckers. You know, I was like, ah, he removes the suckers. Remove those suckers. Uh, but <laughs> suckers are, are parts, so when you have a tree and you have like offshoots that start near the base or even from the roots that come up and like want to be another tree, those are called suckers. So you got to get the suckers out of your life. You know? So he removes the suckers that arise and try and challenge that tree, and he takes care of those. And they're, they're, they're somewhat like deformities of the tree. So the father prunes the true branches, uh, the, the, the true Christians in this section, those who are bearing fruit. He, he's going to prune them that nothing would sap our spiritual energy, that he would clear away the, cut, the clutter. There, there's a worship song that we've sung before. Holy fire, burn away. <laughs> you know, everything that's not of you. And so how does He do this in our life? He does this through trials, through sufferings, through persecution. Is often God's way of pruning us. If, I was a, if you could hear trees speak uh, and, and they got pruned, they might scream a little bit, you know, ow, stop, what's going on? Like, I'm, I'm bearing fruit here and I'm getting cut. But the, the point of that is that the clutter would be removed and that even through the pain, the vine dresser knows what he's doing, that he's, he's bearing fruit. And in our life, when we go through the trials, the sufferings, the, the, the persecution, when the pain comes into our life, there is always a purpose for it. The vine dresser is well aware of what he's doing. That when the pruning happens in our life and we feel the cuts and we feel the pain and, and things being taken away or cut away from our life, that there is purpose for that pain. We must always remember, we must know this on a good day so that when a dark day comes, we have the strength. We know what we're relying upon. And so we have no room for fear or self-pity or complaint because we know there is always purpose in the pain. This is what Hebrews 12 says, that God disciplines those He loves. He chastises those He loves. That He'll, he'll remove things in the life of those He loves so that the focus is put back on Him. This is what He does with the true branches that are bearing fruit and often in our lives. 
And so the trials, the suffering, the persecution, the pain, they all have the distinct way of clearing the clutter away. Isn't it so when you go through a tough time, when you go through a trial in life, it has a way of clearing away the things that really don't matter. And you start to say, you know what? I need to focus on what really matters here. It could be a life or death thing. Like, I need to get right with God. Or I need to, focus, I need to pour into, man, my kids or my wife. I need to, I need to stop you know, worrying so much or, working or you know, being so busy about all these things. I need to focus on what truly matters. And really, trials, suffering, persecution, and pain have the distinct way of doing that in our lives. C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Problem of Pain, he says, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world quoted that before, but I love it because pain has a distinct way of getting our attention, of clearing things away, of, of, of getting our focus, right? We could, we could just drift away in a, a sea of entertainment these days. You know, I was reading about uh, uh, you know, Netflix, you know, that their, their number one competition, the CEO came out and said a while back, he said, their number one competition isn't HBO Go, it's not Hulu, it's not Amazon Prime Video, He's like, we're, we're, the market's plenty good. He said the number one competition of Netflix is sleep, is your sleep, right? The binge watch. I don't know if you've been on, now the, the spacing between uh, videos when you're watching a show, it's like five seconds. That used to be like 20 seconds, and you had time to like get out, you know? Five seconds, you're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that next thing is going to start. So, and, and the idea was like, they want literally... Sleep is the competition. Just binge. Just, just stay up a little later. Stay up a little later. Expend your energy. You'd be a little more tired. you have a little less time the next day. Let this compound and compound. But the pruning will clear away the clutter, whether we like it or not, or whether it's, uh, it feels good or not. God knows how to get our attention, and it's for our own good. That the, fa- the vine dresser prunes. That he brings these things into, he allows these things into our lives. And so that we would not fear it because we are, the next point is that we are cared for. We are cared for by the vine dresser. Our father is the vine dresser. He is in control. He's got his hand on the, the thermostat. Joseph, in Genesis 50, he, he went he, the life of Joseph is an amazing life. He goes through all these trials, all these troubles, all these struggles. He goes through all that. And at the end, triumphantly, he says, no, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Every, the, the, the circumstances were the same. He said God was in control. And he meant it for good. He knew that we would be standing in this place, in this moment, and he would bring good about it. That he would bring me in this position for this time that, there were, that famine would not destroy everybody, but people would have food remaining. So he meant good from it because Joseph kept his eyes on the Lord, right? The New Testament equivalent is Romans 8.28. For I, you know, all things work together for the good for those who love God and those called according to his purpose. And so notice something about the vine dresser here is that the vine dresser is never closer to the branches than when he's pruning them. So when those pains and struggles and trials and, and, and sufferings are in your life, know that the Father is as close as He can be. When, when, when the vine dresser prunes the branches, He is in there pruning, looking at what's going on, cutting away. He's never closer. You could water from afar. You could feed from afar. You could gather fruit even from afar. But to prune, He is the closest. So we should remember that. And the last point this morning is the consistency. The consistency. There's a word that appears seven times here in these seven verses, and it is the word abide. That you would abide, 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 abide. If we go to verse 11, which we were going to, we'll hit those verses 8 through 11 next week. But the, the word abide means to remain to endure, to, to stay the course, right? 
to be consistent, consistent over time, that our lives would be consistent. I remember I went back to Albuquerque to visit family one year, and I was talking with somebody who, who had gone to church, who I'd known at, at, at church years before, and was, were talking and, and you know, telling them what we're doing out here, and, and they had kind of drifted away from the Lord, and they're like, oh, well, you're still doing that, huh? You're still doing that Christian, oh, you're pastor, wow, you're, you're serious about that. I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not some passing fad for me, like I'm a disciple, I'm committed, I'm consistent, like God has changed my life. What am I going to do, drift away? Like to what? He alone has the words of eternal life. It just struck me as like, you know, it just is like, oh, he's still doing it. But it was sad because what that entailed is, is several people do that. They go to church. They have a time where they're, they're at church. They're seeking God. Things come in. They get busy about other things, and they kind of drift away. One of the most defining marks of a Christian here, of a true believer, is somebody who's consistent, who's someone who is committed. I love Acts 2.42, one of the, the things that the disciples did all at the beginning, it said they were devoted to the apostles' doctrine or to the word of God. I love that word. They were devoted. They were committed. It wasn't just like, oh, the weather's tough. Ah, I'm not committed. Oh, this going on. Oh, I don't know. Oh, the red chair's moved over there. Ah, I know what's going on. You know, like freaking out. Like, ah, I'm out of here. You know, it wasn't like some, some little things. They were committed consistent to, to the Lord. Sorry, that, that, it, it threw me off too. I'm like, where am I? You know, red chairs are over there. They used to be over there. That's good. Shake it up. You know, that, <laughs> that we would be consistent in our walk with the Lord. The two distinguishing marks of a true Christian, of a true branch in these verses, in red letters, according to Jesus, is that we would bear fruit and don't worry, we're gonna, all next week we're going to dive into that bearing fruit, what, what, what that looks like, what that is, what that entails, what the fruit is about, what it means, what we can glean from that bearing of fruit. One, that we would bear fruit, and two, that we would abide, that we would continue in the way. I love this church. This church has, has many members to it that have, have been here for a long time. They've, they've been here longer than, any, longer than I have, longer than Dino had, longer than anyone has been here. And they have continued in the faith. They've continued in the right path. They've endured. They've, they've overcome. They've, they've, they, you know, it's, it's not how high you jump. It's how straight you walk after you hit the ground and how consistent you are. And I cannot stress these enough because it does break my heart to see people get excited about the Lord and what God's doing. And then over time to see the fade. You know, some just fade away, they just drift away. And Jesus gave the parable of the soils. You know, there will be some that are like, ooh, yeah, like, you know, pumped. And then there's no root, there's no, there's no depth. They don't grow, they don't be discipled and learn the Word of God and know how to study the Bible and enjoy it and all those great things. So, in closing, in closing, Four questions for us this morning from these verses. Is the first one is, are you connected? Are you connected to Christ? You're not talking LinkedIn. You're not talking all, all these sites. Are you connected to Christ? This is the connection that matters. This is the only one that matters in the last day. Are you connected to Christ? Do you know Jesus? Is He your Lord and your Savior? Do you know, yes, I'm connected with the Lord. I hear from the Lord. I love His Word. When I read it, it comes alive in my soul. Romans 8 says that the Spirit of God confirms with our spirit that we are children of God. I mean, I can't even explain that, but are you connected with the Lord? The second question, are you cut? Are you cut? Is God in the process of, of removing things in your life, things that are maybe trivial, things that you have put above Him, He will often cut away. Is your focus on the eternal things? God will prune those that He loves. He will get our focus back on Him because He loves us. 
And yes, every good and perfect gift is from Him. And every good and perfect, all these great things that we have in life are, are from Him. They're a shadow though. They're all a shadow of what we are to have in Christ, of the relationship we are to have in Christ, the connection that we are to have in Christ. That we don't lose sight of that. Third question is, do you know you're cared for and loved? Do you know that? Do you know when you go through trial, when you go through pain, when you go through anxiety, when you go through stress, when the bottom seems like it falls out, do you know in a moment of strength right now, I think this is a moment of strength, we're, we're here, we made it, we look great, you guys look fantastic, right? Smell pretty good, I'm sure. Right, we got ourselves together. This is probably a moment of strength, right? Do you know that you are cared for by the vine dresser, by the Father? And he cares deeply for you. I remember a, a, a story I heard of a psychiatrist saying that she could release half of her patients today if she knew that they were loved. Or if they knew that they were loved and cared for. If they knew they were loved and cared for. So the Father loves and cares. Know that. Know that. right? Because the trials and the storms, they will come. And the fourth question is, are you consistent? Are you consistent? Is your consistency in Christ? Are you pursuing Him? Are you, 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 you faithful? When football season comes around and the, 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 faith, the 49er faithful signs come up, it's like, man, people know how to be faithful, right? People know how to be consistent. They know how, man, whether the team sucks or whether they're good, they're like, I will be faithful, you know? But are we consistent, faithful to Christ, pursuing Him? And that we would be, that we would be consistent. That that would be a, 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 a characteristic of our life. Now, oh, yeah. Yeah. Nish? Yeah. He's serving the Lord. I know. Why? Because he's, he's, he's consistent. You know? Bob? Yeah. Consistency. Like there's consistency in the same direction over time, not always glamorous, not always glory, not, not always a buzz, but there's, there's a consistency in pursuing the Lord. And the fruit we will get to next week. So Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for these verses, God, that we are just a branch. God, I pray that we would be a branch that bears fruit. God, I pray that we would not be dead wood here, that our lives would bear much fruit. And we just, we don't really, I mean, we have things we could do to that end, but we also, it's, it's, it's a, we're dependent upon you, Lord. We, do, we, we are connected, we do all we can to be connected to the vine. And Lord, that everything else would simply flow up into our lives and then through our lives. That we wouldn't bottleneck the blessings that you give into our lives and, and try and just keep them for ourselves, God, but that we would continuously just let it flow through us. God, all that you would want to do. Lord, I pray this morning for every person here, God, that you would speak, Lord, all that you want to flow through their lives in all the unique ways that you have handcrafted us and, and designed us. God, what do you want to flow through our lives? To the world, to, to our neighbor, to, to those around us, especially right now in this season, God. In this season where it can be so good be so fun. There's, there's people around us, but it could also be so dark. Especially if, if we've, if this marks an anniversary of something rough that we've been through, of a tough time, this, this could be a trying time. God, and I pray that what would flow through our lives, God, would be to the benefit of those around us, to the blessing of those around us, to the to pointing to Christ those around us, the true riches, the true treasure, which is eternal, 
secure in heaven that we can get a glimpse of and taste and walk in here as well. God, I pray that you would speak, Lord, whatever you want to flow through us as branches. And I pray if there's anybody that is not connected to Christ, that doesn't know Jesus, that has not given their life to Christ, knowing that he endured the cross and the shame and the wrath of God for you. That you can know that you are forgiven, that you can know when you die, you will go to heaven, that these promises are true, and that you can bank upon them. If you don't know Christ this morning, you can know him before you leave. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you, give you something. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you bless this time of worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to take tithe and offering. And we are going to have the communion elements out after as well and as the worship is going. And a beautiful time to reflect, God, what would you, what, what fruit do you want to bear in my life? What blessing do you want to flow through me to others, to the world? together as, as a family or if you want to take on your own, however you want, we're going to have the elements out. Only do so if you are connected. It's a picture of, of tasting the forgiveness that has been purchased for us at the cross.
wide open like a like a good good father that he is and he wants us to be like his babies you know when you have a newborn baby the baby just trusts you when you're holding the baby in your arms the parent would be the world everything to that child is coming to us right now with his arms open wide and he wants us to be that child that just falls into his arms as he cradles us in all of our needs all of our um, desperation he just wants us to trust him and, and, and abide in his love so I want you to take a moment just pray. Pray to the Lord. If you need to trust Him more, just ask Him. And just take a moment to fall in His arms. We bring you all of our praise, God. All of our 
affection, all of our devotion, you pour it. We anoint your feet with it, God. So this morning, Lord, we say that we want to abide in you. And we thank you. Thank you, God, for choosing us and giving us the privilege of being called your children, your branches. Lord, it is true. You're always, you're always wanting the best for us. And we trust your intentions, your heart. Even in the difficult times, even when we are being pruned, God, we can say that it is well, that you are good.
the love that lives in us, Lord, the love that you pour out to us, Lord, that we could stand in confidence and say, it is well with my soul, no matter what, Lord. Your love, your faithfulness, they carry us through, Lord God. Always faithful, always good, and always true to us, Lord. Would we continue to abide in you, Lord, just to be that extension of who you are, Lord, knowing that you are our source of love and of power. Um, yeah, be glorified this week, Lord. We continue to praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, holy night, the stars.